Okay, well, thank you very much for attending our session. Uh, this session is uh, on intensive economic growth in pre-modern East Asia, 1000 to 1800. And I'd like to briefly introduce our panel. Uh, first off, we'll have Dr. Kent Dung speaking on demystifying growth in the development of Northern Song China, 960 to 1127. Uh, Professor Yoshini Bashiba will be the discussant for that paper. Second will be William Guang Ling Liu, uh, and his paper is entitled The Study of Evolution of China's Farming Patterns and Changes in Agricultural Productivity circa uh, 1000 to 1500. And uh, the eminent Professor Yoshini Bashiba will also discuss that paper. Third will be myself, Ron Edwards, uh, and I'm a uh, my paper is entitled Economic Growth in Song China in England, and uh, Professor William Guangling Liu will be the discussant for that paper. Uh, next will be uh, Kajiro Taguchi, and he is t the title of his paper is Economic Development of the Early Modern China Revisiting, and Professor Mio Kishimoto will be the discussant for that paper. Uh, Kenichi Tanobi will be the next uh, presenter. Fertility, Mortality, and Economic Development in Tokugawa, Japan. And that will be uh, Pri Professor Price Fishback will be the discussant for that paper. Last but not least will be Miho Tanaka. Uh, and she's going to present a paper on long-term interest rate changes in the credit and loan markets and economic development during Ko Tokugawa, Japan. Uh, excuse me, Tokugawa period. And uh, Naomi Lamoy will be the presenter uh, as the discussant for that paper. So without further ado, for time constraints, let's go ahead and, and please, uh, Dr. Dung, please uh, come up and present. Yeah, thank you, Rong. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I know this is really a uh, end of the day and uh, also very hot. So I'm going to do it very quickly. Um, the issue is Song China and its intensive growth. Um, when I did my PhD, uh, my, my supervisor told me, tell me about Song. And uh, I said, I, I, I know nothing about Song. And he, <laughs> he was completely disappointed. He said, you, know, you are Chinese. How come you don't know anything about Song? Now, 25 years later, I know something about Song. <laughs> so here we are. Now, uh, the difference between Song and pre-Song town is that the Song uh, economy uh, supported a doubled population, and the song was very uh, commercialized, and it's a, it, it, the the urbanization rate uh, e easily doubled the, the town uh, level, and the song was the beginning of the Chinese maritime history. Selling the Chinese start to sell across East Asia and Southeast Asian waters. So why and how Song became so specialized, uh, uh, you know, a special case in, in Chinese history? Why it didn't happen before and why it didn't continue later on? So to find out why, I will be very, very quick. Um, there are two uh, issues here uh, and two major factors. One is uh, um, environmental. The other one is geopolitical. Now, the environmental I story is this. Um, this is the right slide. If you divide the Song territory, which was roughly the Qin Empire, when China was first united by the first emperor, uh, you, you see China's territory actually shrunk from its town uh, record size. If you divide the Song territory into these zones, then you realize, in fact, the northern part of Song, uh, agricultural uh, production declined. Uh, report, reports were such that nobody wanted to farm in North China. Why? Simply because we had a little ice age, uh, mainly affecting that part of China. Now, so 
people start to move south to grow food, uh, food prices going up simply because the shortage of food. And uh, in the north, people, well, those who decide to stay, they become more commercialized and st they start to mine uh, iron ore and they start to uh, produce iron steel. Especially in northern part of uh, uh, the territory around Kaifeng, where the capital city was located. So the natural disaster actually uh, persuaded Chinese not to farm, which is really quite you know, extraordinary. Now, in the South, uh, they decide, because of the Little Ice Age, um, to support enough, you know, to support people with enough food, they introduce a, a winter crop, which is the uh, winter wheat uh, along the Yangtze River region. So you have a double cropping uh, in the south. Further south, and also in the west, um, farming was still very primitive, but because in the north people start to produce metals, in these two regions, uh, copper, uh, lead, and tin, uh, three major uh, metals to produce uh, bronze coins uh, began to take off. So you, you see the, you know, the regional division of labor reshuffled in such a way it becomes something else. Uh, the farming economy becoming, in, in some ways, a mixed economy. Now, meanwhile, um, the Song faced enormous pressure from the north uh, perhaps for the same reason, because the Little Ice Age pushed the uh, nomads southwards. And uh, during this period, this is a great war. The great war was lost to the nomads. Also, the Silk Road is gone. So the Song Chinese start to pay tribute, oddly, to their uh, northern uh, neighbors. Uh, this was the other, you know, it should be the other way around. You know, uh, these guys should pay tribute to uh, the, the Chinese, but not anymore. Why? Because, you know, they defeat the Chinese repeatedly. Uh, the Song army never actually won any war at all against all the nomads. So to actually support the demand from the nomads, um, the whole economy geared towards uh, uh, selling. Why? Because the nomads didn't ask for women, they didn't ask for slaves, they didn't ask even for food. They want silk, they want silver, they want uh, luxuries uh, from Southeast Asia, um, you know, uh, such as uh, on the record spices such as uh, uh, turtle shells. So the Song Chinese had to actually go out to find those things. Otherwise, they will march in to finish the Song regime off. Indeed, they did. Um, at the end of Northern Song, uh, they, take off, they take over the northern territory of the Song dynasty, and this will be the beginning of the southern Song. So this is a demarcation, uh, politically line between the nomads and the southern Song. So basically, the Song economy was in uh, in a, uh, in a turning point uh, to become more commercialized because of the climate uh, the climate change and also geo. Uh, geopolitical uh, threat from the north. So after that, we, we see a change which can be highlighted as such. <laughs> I have one uh, chat to show what what's going on, and that will be the end of my presentation. I have some, you know, 
uh, usual kind of a, a quantitative uh, attempt to show the changes. Um, let's see where we are. I promise wrong, I have to be very short, it's very, very quick. Uh, Oh. Speed reading course, yes, indeed. You, we, we, we pay a lot of money for doing that. Uh, oh, God. Where are we? I have a, a quite neat diagram. No. It's probably not in, in this, with this version. Anyway, um, the result is this. Uh, the Chinese farming uh, become regionalized and intensively uh, done. Secondly, the Chinese economy start to uh, become open towards uh, shipping towards Southeast Asia. I just visited this morning uh, the Cultural Museum of Kyoto, and they have a display of collections of Chinese coins and also displays of Chinese uh, porcelain. The green porcelain started from Song Dynasty. Indeed, uh, the Japanese start to import large quantities of green porcelain from the Song, Ch you know, from, from Song China, and also loads of coins um, hoard, hoarded by the, high, you know, the, the, the upper classes of this town. And uh, so here we are. Uh, even in this place, uh, we still find history uh, showing the changes in China. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for my uh, inferior quality of the English. Um, the paper presented by Professor uh, Den uh, is an indeed a provocative uh, argument on the uh, causes of growth in, in some, some economy. It also challenges uh, uh, some of the uh, Com conventional no uh, notions that are that is, that is still prevailing. Professor can uh, start with um, one percent uh, population increase, population growth during the term uh, through the late late on the northern sun, as an indication of an unprecedented. Uh, evidence of the growth in the history of Chinese economy. Uh, th then he moves to his search for the causal explanation that brought about such growth and prosperity. First, uh, he re reject the uh, uh, the surprise, surprise and explanation, uh, especially the notion of the agrarian revolution, once uh, raised by the Hopi tea uh, under the influence of the Kato Shigeshi. And uh, uh, among others, Professor Dan reject the dissemination of improved rice seed. Champarais. Uh, in the rice culture uh, of the middle and the south part of China and the Song, uh, the, generally, the, I agree, uh, I contend with his idea. So, so and, and, but, but in my view, the Champarais is a just some one kind of the early ripening rices. And uh, m my under some Japanese understanding of the merit of the champ rice is that uh, 
it enables the farmers to avoid the damage uh, by the heavy rainfalls in June and uh, September. So that it means a uh, stabilization of rice culture uh, in the area of the just reclaimed uh, uh, paddies in the central and south China. Yes. So, uh, 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 but uh, uh, there, there's another Japanese uh, notion that uh, uh, in, in terms of technology, the sun uh, advancement is not so high. Uh, in just uh, uh, inherited the northern uh, uh, the, the, the traditional um, technologies in the north and in the south, then the evidence is very rather uh, scarce about the introduction of the, uh, auctions and uh, new type of farm tools and the fertilizers and so. so the, we should uh, ask the causes of the population growth. If we take the population growth as a surrogate of the economic uh, development, uh, the, we should uh, uh, look into the, uh, another reasons, cause. that is on uh, the demand side. And he uh, also put emphasis in, in his paper. The, <coughs> Of course, and uh, I just forgot to say that uh, uh, Professor Kent uh, refers to the uh, s some kind of the improvement of agriculture in the north. In the north, but I I, I, I cannot believe in that. Uh, for example, the, uh, by the record of the Fu Fu Chi in the middle of the Yuan, uh, the. There is an estimation that uh, uh, millet cultivation in the north, uh, this is the case of the Shandong, was uh, still largely stable or unstable. And uh, people had to cultivate uh, 100 more of land. But uh, uh, every alternative year, the, uh, the harvest and failure, crop failure, visited uh, that farm. So the, uh, all those uh, uh, estimated uh, uh, e uh, e parika yield of the, uh, about uh, um, point eight, point 0.8 bushel of land. But uh, the people have to calculate the average yields as an, uh, just half of that. Because then every 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 another year, the disasters comes. So, so so uh, uh, so far as I uh, I believe in this uh, testimony, some uh, um, values, and I I think um, the uh, in, in the middle of the uh, young times the. Uh, Agriculture in the north was uh, not so high and uh, unstable. And this is a notion that uh, Professor Lee also uh, referring to. The, the, say, okay. <laughs> okay. Then move to the, the uh, Professor Kent's second the theme that uh, the, uh, Professor done a lot of important suggestions. This is I, I, this is very impressive. One. That is the uh, pressure, uh, pressure from. Uh, northern nomads, tribes, and the some states compromising uh, diplomacy uh, in response to it. 
by giving a, a ransom uh, to such a uh, northern people, uh, a fair amount of the silver and uh, silk clothes and tea. Uh, <coughs> and, and Professor Dunn suggests that uh, these are uh, uh, burdens of the northern government. Uh, let, uh, let them to push for the in industries and circulation of the such uh, items of international trade, or like um, uh, tea and silk and so on. Uh, this would be so, but uh, I have some uh, skepticism about uh, about the topic. Uh, we have uh, some data in the maritime trade in the south that uh, through Guangdong and Zhuangzhou, uh, uh, the evidence uh, survived to tell us that. Uh, uh, Abundant amount of silver uh, was exported from these two ports, but uh, in the hand, uh, but in the hand of the Islamic merchants, they surely come came from the Iran and uh, East East uh, Islamic Empire. So the 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 trade as the, the south or and the silver traded at the south uh, had they paid their weight in. To the Islamic world, the, and the problem is that in the north, some Japanese argues that uh, uh, fair amounts of the ransom and the traded silver came back to the Chinese territory through the uh, exchange at the border. I, I don't know whether this is true or not, but. Uh, uh, I want to know the termi termination, destination of the silver, silk, and uh, other and tea and other items of the trade. If the, they, are, the, they, are, they get back to the China, that's a, it's not a big problem. But the, uh, uh, recent Japanese studies are uh, uh, giving stories of the the people of Sogudian and uh, um, Uyghurian people, Uyghurian merchant, who were uh, acted as a middleman in the silk road, uh, tended to be willing, very influential power in that, in that route of uh, in the trade of the East West. So if the silver, uh, uh, or uh, silver uh, went to uh, northern nomads uh, by way of the ransom or the uh, border, border trade. Uh, uh, the, uh, went to the western part of the uh, Silk Road and uh, get into the hands of the uh, Iran, Iranian merchant. This is a big, big, big problem, uh, Eurasian trade. As a whole, so I, I want to know that um, where is the silver and the silks uh, finally went to. Them. So uh, as, as to the the state rule, uh, I think that there is. Uh, I agree, generally agree with him with uh, uh, Professor Dan's uh, notion, but uh, there is problem of the uh, relationship between the. Uh, uh, <coughs> civil civil service uh, government, civil bureaucracy, uh, and uh, it's an uh, uh, economic economic uh, ec economic growth. Uh, Professor John Hicks once suggested that uh, uh, although the civil service bureaucracy will be strengthened by the power of the e-commerce and the economy. But uh, the, the relationship, relationship between the states and the uh, economy 
it's still not uh, certain. This, this is a problem to be uh, created for him in the future. So, for example, in the warring safe period, the China's uh, uh, economy is not so well developed. But you know, very uh, successful civil, bu civil bureaucracy emerged at this time. But, and in the, it, it was a matter of the uh, time of some period that uh, uh, rising commerce and economy uh, surely uh, strengthened the emergence of the more, the emergence of the restructuring of the civil, civil service bureaucracy. So that how, how the state's role uh, in the economy. The, the um, uh, document suggested that mostly the revenue economy, not the real economy. So, uh, revenue economy will be managed by the bureaucrats. But uh, uh, behind of that, there is a rise of the general private sector economy. So this is my suggestion. Okay. Next, we have Professor William Wang Lin Biao from uh, Science Technology University, Hong Kong. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my t talk. Thanks to uh, many of my teacher friends. Uh, Shiba Sensei, uh, in particular, I want to uh, express my gratitude. Uh, let me explain uh, the current paper. Uh, it's uh, actually a, a byproduct of my uh, PhD thesis. Uh, in my PhD thesis, I try to compare in quantitative way uh, the Tangshong transformation, which center in the 11th, uh, 10th and 11th century with uh, uh, Mingqing transformation uh, that lasted, lasted from the 16th century down to the, uh, you know, the whole 17th century. <laughs> uh, well, uh, to my surprise, I mean, uh, everyone you complain we do not have enough data, uh, but to my surprise, I mean, uh, we still find uh, uh, some reliable data that person particularly concentrated on the 11th century and the uh, later 14th century and the early 15th century, the early Ming period when the Ming dynasty was established. And, uh, and we are lucky we have the data on you know, the population, uh, money, stocks, uh, you, know, you can use uh, uh, coin produced by imperial means to reconstruct the money stock. And uh, you know, the trade volume based on the commercial tax data. And, uh, Okay, I will stay here. <laughs> and at the point of the market expansion in the 11th century, uh, you know, as a, basically that's my conclusion. Uh, and what happened, uh, uh, then you see the market contract in the early Ming period due to the anti-market policy uh, promoted by the uh, founding emperor Zhu Yuanzhang of the Ming dynasty. Uh, he hated merchants, he, he hated the bureaucracy, he hated he hate corruption. So he basically, we, we know, we learn from many uh, anecdotes and historical documents that he, his, he executed them or sent a lot of them, uh, you know, exiled to the frontier and confiscated their family property and land holding. That's all the, you know, this uh, qualitative evidence. Uh, but surprisingly, we do find, you know, if measure in the macroeconomic level, we find the diminish of the market. Uh, what about the 16th century? Unfortunately, uh, because the data became, the, the quality of data declined sharply. It became unreliable. Uh, so we, we have nothing to say about the uh, Mingqing transformation in quantitative way. Although in personally, I believe the Chinese market you know, played a very large role in, the, in this new economic development. Uh, that will be a challenge for the future research. However, 
uh, I was, I'm challenged first by the feedbacks, the scholars, they doubt the, um, my research for a couple of reasons, the two major reasons. One, through my research you can find uh, in opposite to our thinking, in Chinese economic history, this historical data, you find the earlier the period, the better the quality. You know, that's a little bit strange. And the second reason is, uh, uh, as uh, you know, this uh, one uh, commentator, commentator, the external reviewer commented in the, my, my book, my revenue, uh, manuscript, is uh, I, I only use those market-based data and the military wage data, uh, which you know present a very relatively a small <coughs> share of the traditional Chinese economy, right? The majority, the main sector is agriculture. The majority of the population were farmers. How this even you assume I'm right, right? How can I go further to prove changes in the market would substantially influence uh, the living standard of commoners who, in their daily life, you know, if not isolated from, but, I, but surely keep a certain distance from the market, right? It's, it's not a modern China, it's a traditional China. Uh, and uh, so that basically is a question. And uh, thanks for his advice, I, you know, revised my manuscript into uh, the two books. Uh, so far, I just finished this one book that focuses on the economic performance and the data quality and the appendices to explain about, about why the quality is reliable or not. Uh, I will skip over this part. It's not the focus on my report today. But basically, I would uh, just give one sentence to explain. Uh, it's not only the years, you know, early or uh, later years to decide the quality of data. It's rather all this data was uh, produced by the government. So it's basically and initially and basically is a perception of the government decided the quality of data. If the government knows you know, uh, how the market performed, then you get the data, like the commercial type data, will much more accurate, so to speak, to reflect the, long, the trend in the, in the market. And, and also the, the population. If the government allow free migration, uh, for instance, in the 11th and 12th century China, then you will know exactly without tremendous difficulty the government would know the long-term trend in the aggregate household across the country. But when it came to the early Ming period, the free migration was forbidden, right? It's basically incorporate, forced people into Li Jia Si term is a hereditary. Uh, with the resistance, right? Certainly you can expect the resistance. The people, you know, fly away from where they want to live, but they will never report to the government. So government has no correct information. <clears throat> so that's so far about the data part. But what about the agricultural productive part? It's really in difficult. And I must admit, I do not have the reliable data at the macro level. Uh, what I try to do is related the, all these uh, as uh, able I able to I'm able to identify the variables incorporate a framework I, I as I mentioned here a shift from intensive farming to extensive agriculture to interpret this long term decline in agriculture productivity I will not define the terms as it's all familiar to you basically I'm trying to say the early Ming Emperor Zhu Yuanzhang established a command economy that made people either you know, lost the incentive to produce, you know, before previously in comparison, they driven by market, produce for more profit, or because it's a forced migration, people were forced to move to the west, farm the wasteland uh, without support uh, of technology, uh, farm, farming tool, fertilizer, and even without uh, this uh, drafting animal. So this uh, farm size extended at the same time, the household farm size. So in inevitably it caused a huge decline in farm yield per acre. Here is a new question, right? Uh, although this uh, Zhu Yuanzhang, the Emperor Zhu Yuanzhang was uh, brutal uh, to intellectual and the rich people, uh, you know, his blooding, uh, he, 
he basically executed so many official generals and high officials. But he claimed it will do good since he's clean the official term. He's do good to the commoner. And even he tried to damage people, right? He was emperor. How could one individual influence millions of millions changing the people, right? He was not the chairman more. Uh, where is my evidence? Where is the command economy, right? In a traditional period without this, all this communist ideology, uh, modern police, all these things, right? Where, where come my data? Um, uh, I will skip over the Northern Sun part. It's, you know, in general, I shared with Dr. Uh, Deng report, uh, you know, about this uh, uh, agriculture, this in North China, all these things, uh, along with urbanization. Only one thing I would like to mention is my estimate as uh, Northern Sun, you know, shared this uh, farm yield per acre, uh, per moon, was even lower than 20% lower than Dr. Deng's. Uh, that already would allow the Sun farmers to live uh, a higher living standard. I, I avoid using the term uh, economic growth since, as I mentioned, it's uh, not really agricultural data to prove uh, this point. Uh, what's the difference you see the sh you, you to allow the extensive uh, decline in agricultural productivity uh, caused by the extensive culture, you need to uh, reach this point. You know, this, this is a very low record. Uh, and this is a huge difference from my estimate with uh, Professor Dr. Perkins' estimate about the early mean, which have done 20 years ago. So what happened, what caused this huge decline? I followed the Professor Duarte's approach. You basically, what you need to prove is what happened in Northwest China, North China, East China, and Central China, because they accounted for the very dominant share of Chinese acre. And here comes the, what I named the command economy. In the Lower Yang Delta, even we follow the revisionist argument, especially the uh, Li Bo Zhong, Professor Li Bo Zhong argument, this is a very higher uh, agricultural productivity, even during the Yuan and the early Ming. However, we have the data to prove Zhu Yuanzhang basically destroyed the landlord here. And he controlled by this way, he confiscated their land holding, he controlled in Shanghai area, more than 80% of the rural land holding. In the whole Lower Yang Delta, it's close to 60%. How severe it, it was, it even surpassed what the Chairman Mao did in the early 1950, after the Communist Party took over. So you have this, this agricultural product is sustained, right? But political economy works. That's political, that's a command economy in one aspect. This is one special round. Then in Fujian, Guangdong, and the part of the Jiangxi, we do not have the sufficient data. Although we know Li Jia system was carried on here. Here you have the long front line, right? That's the legacy from Mongol conquest, which Chinese government, Sino government could not control, but not because the Mongol imperialism they inherited this large part of territory. Uh, well, seizable, right? But uh, poor land, uh, no, no market town, no water transportation. Uh, Zhu Yuanzhang forced the people to move there to defend this land. People there was uh, administered by the military system. Even they were uh, commoner farm the land. And in North China and the central China here, the, the upper and the mid Yangtze River, you have depopulation. Basically, all this, you know, Prosperity, commerce, cities, uh, they, were, they were gone because of Mongol conquest the first. Then you have the civil war in the later 14th century. Uh, and this part, all this part acreage in this area accounted for nearly two thirds of China's total area on the cultivation, right? That makes, that represents a very different a measurable image in comparison to the Jiangnan to Lower Yangtze. And the Zhu Yuanzhang sent the soldiers stationed there, 80% he has more than one million soldiers, 80% were assigned to farmland because 
He never wants to use money to wage wars. Right? He used a self-sufficient way. And they also forced the millions of people to move there. According to the recent population historian research, they based on uh, the genealogy study of the name of the places and the field research, all these things. They estimate for every six people in the early Ming, one was involuntary migrant. So this uh, this land farmed, you know, in this uh, farmed by this uh, involuntary migrants accounted for uh, more than sixty percent of Chinese total acreage. And what what kind of capital or technical support you could get from the uh, from the government or from themselves, you would find the this pretty pretty low. Uh, here is uh, you know this uh, uh, population density. First, uh, you, we we mentioned the depopulation. Here you can compare this uh, uh, population density in the 1393 with uh, soon the the peak year of the Song economy. The huge, huge decline, right? Uh, Five percent or just ten percent to uh, if in the extreme case. And you have the study the name of the villager and the genealogy that prove you know the large percentage from the migrant. And here is the data about the uh, drafting animals, right? The number of oxen used in the military farm, we do not have the information from the civilian, you know, forced migrant. But for the military, the soldier farm, we do have a report, because the report level by level from the general to Beijing. Uh, so you, <laughs> if you divide the number of oxen by the acreage under the military farm, then you get this average farm size, you know, per ox. And it's uh, very huge in Henan, and also in Hubei and Hunan, right? Uh, that makes the, the case, uh, you know, I only made a very small adjustment to Dwight Perkins estimation, but the result is quite opposite because he, he, he ignored this part, the central China, the central China. He um, downplayed the significance of this region. And if you add them that together, Nanzi and Hubei and Hunan, the Nanzi uh, north of the Yangtze River, but close to the uh, Nanjing, the Fengyang, Yangzhou, uh, those regions. And we do, now I have the scanty record of the farm yield reported either from the military farm or from the gazetteer uh, or literati report. Uh, it's not systematic, as I emphasize. Otherwise, I will. 100% confident to claim uh, uh, my research, you know, the, the, the conclusion. So you did see the huge decline in the later 13 in Shandong Peninsula and also in the northern Hebei. And we do have, you know, this uh, civilian migrants that report how each shared, you know, you have 100 Household just share, you know, so few uh, oxen number. Uh, so that's my conclusion. The finally, yes, we did. We did find without uh, the rule of the market, you know, the early Ming emperor claimed to build up an egalitarian society. He uh, eliminated the rich upper class, the landlord and the merchant. Will it do good to the commoner? The answer was no. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. So again, we have uh, Professor Yoshimi Kishida from the Economics previous paper. Yes, and, uh, uh, I was deeply impressed by the. Uh, Professor Liu's uh, paper, uh, which is a very, indeed, a um, uh, uh, fresh contribution to the. Uh, yes. Look, look, 
macroscopic uh, interpretation of the large long run trajectory of Chinese uh, uh, economic history since the soon. Uh, let me limit myself in a, a three points. The first is my appreciation of uh, Professor Liu's uh, uh, analysis of the uh, hiatus, uh, wrong, uh, mysterious hiatus that took place uh, during uh, of the economic growth uh, for about uh, two centuries uh, since the uh, late year to the mid. Uh, here again, I, uh, the pioneer of this uh, issue was an Hopi. He, uh, he uh, Hopi refers to the, uh, the uh, break, breakdown of the, uh, or the uh, down, slowing down of the pace of the economy in the early mean. But uh, he uh, explained it was just in seventy years. Uh, it recovers it by, by the uh, uh, resumption of the Grand Canal in 1415. So it's about only 70 years. Uh, but uh, Professor uh, uh, Liu's uh, estimate is that uh, it, it lasts very long. It start, started with an early mean to the, to the 1540s, and it happened to be in the year. Of the, the beginning of the uh, silver uh, equal uh, in large scale in the mean times. So, um, uh, the, okay, yes, uh, so I think that the main struggle were, uh, with uh, the UN in, uh, was, uh, was many uh, discouraging, and, uh, left many discouraging effect for, the, for this depression, depressive trend of the Chinese economy. The, uh, for example, the, the, as the Professor Liu suggested, the, uh, enforced uh, uh, migration and uh, of people to the depopulated area and, and uh, uh, exp uh, enforcement of military firms and uh, 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 mean policy of the subsidy, sub uh, subsistent economy and uh, Demonetation, uh, forcible migration, and, and so these, and also the lowering of the military salary, and all these elements are jointly affected badly to the growth of the uh, early economy, and <coughs> the particularly uh, the. Uh, depression and affair affected the North China since the uh, Jirujin Jin and the Yuan and the, in the meantime. And, and this is, uh, uh, this was an, uh, uh, at the time of the Hopi team, this was uh, just a guess. But uh, Professor <coughs> Liu uh, brought, brought the problem. It's a more detailed analysis, but uh, uh, particularly. Uh, <coughs> Professor Liu provides us and with a long, long-term perspective of the ups and downs of the trajectory of Chinese economy since uh, some times. He also examines um, some uh, <coughs> economic growth, uh, economic <coughs> Chinese economic growth as an uh, outcome of the uh, interaction of the. Uh, key economic elements of labor, land, and the capital. What I am uh, particularly interested in is in, uh, his approach in his use of the term uh, uh, standard of living. 
uh, in assessing it as such, as uh, each uh, locality and at each time, he examines the conditions of both uh, supply side and the demand side synthetically. For example, he argued that uh, the, <coughs> the increasing uh, food demand from population growth in the zone was uh, largely met, by, met or matched by the both increase in the acreage of the cultivated land and the unprecedented uh, 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 yeah, improvements in, uh, in farm yields by it. So uh, he sees a uh, demographic growth as uh, it met by the uh, other <coughs> improvements in the uh, uh, elements of economy. So, uh, so this, I think, uh, is a very important uh, postulation. In, in, other, in other part of his paper, he, uh, he argues that the uh, uh, notion of the agrarian revolution, uh, I, I, I took that uh, at uh, Professor Dan's uh, uh, paper also, uh, uh, is, a, is somehow an overstatement. And, uh, and instead, he looks into the uh, improvements of the livelihood, or the uh, improvement of standard living by very uh, inten progressive, in intensive uh, farming and commercialization of the uh, economy. Uh, the, <coughs> the third point is not a comment, but an that's a suggestion. Uh, as to the link of the production and the consumption, there is a pop, pop, popular formula existing among the uh, element. For example, uh, at least five elements are considered together. The one is in the size of family, uh, size of family, and uh, also the second is the size of the acreage tilled, and the third is uh, per acre productivity, and the fourth is an yearly consumption of grain, and. And uh, grain and crows and the other daily necessities. Uh, and the fourth is an amount of the rate of taxation and uh, amount and rate of taxation. And the uh, seventh is an extent of the involvement in commerce and. Uh, uh, urbanization. And this kind of uh, testimony uh, started with an evolving set period uh, in the remarkable decay. De and then uh, we find that relatively many testimonies in the Song Yuan and Mid times. So uh, it, it would be helpful for you to develop your study to collect such an. Uh, my useful data uh, from uh, 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 mean and chin data, mean and some mean chin data, and to assess the uh, relationship more accurately. Uh, we have uh, many, uh, not so many, but very useful data about uh, the connection of the, these fifth or five elements together. And, uh, otherwise, uh, they the use uh, the data of the per acre yield and then uh, just need just to uh, uh, rough round number round data and and the, the inclusive of the um, family and daily necessity and, uh, and spending for the clothes and the 
and so it's a, it's a, uh, uh, very, uh, it, it is useful for to get together to make a static space, but uh, uh, we have some more reliable data uh, to uh, to give. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, I just need to get to the right slides and I will be all right. How do you get to the full? Yeah, this one. There we go. Okay, I'm Ron Edwards from Tom Kong University and uh, this paper differs from the set of papers presented here today in that uh, it's stylistic. Uh, there is a quantitative part, but I'm not going to go over it because out of time. Uh, most of my research has been uh, trying to document qualitatively uh, economic growth during the Song period. Uh, so uh, that's not going to be com covered here. This is more of a general framework uh, to think about that so um, granted that needs to be documented in fact that has been the majority of my, my work over the, over the over the past decade but this is just a, a framework in the comparison with England to think about these types of things so you're going to find uh, evidence of Song China's uh, growth and development uh, completely lacking uh, but nonetheless, uh, I hope this comparison will uh, help us think about uh, comparing China, and, Song China, and England in particular. Um, I'm just going to use. I guess we use the arrows. I can't, there we go. For those of you who don't know, Song China simply means China during the Song Dynasty, which is 960 to 1279, uh, for which Marco Polo caught the end of. And here's an outline of uh, the talk that I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to make the case that there are two types of economic growth, modern and pre-modern economic growth. And the important point to gain from this is that pre-modern economic the pre-economic uh, economic growth type is necessary for the modern economic growth type. That's the reason for going into this. Um, and I'm going to argue that England, at least from the 1750 to 1850 period, and Song China both experienced this pre-modern economic growth. And in particular, both of these cases were pre, uh, preceded by what I'm going to call an embryonic stage, which is a set of pre-modern economic, would set pre-modern economic growth in motion. So I'm trying to ask the question of what what the main causal factor that set these uh, in motion. So the conclusion is going to be. If we're interested in finding what caused this pre-modern economic growth, we should focus on what caused this, this, this embryonic stage. Okay, so this is the rough, the rough outline. Okay, so two types of economic growth. Uh, what I'm going to uh, first do is define economic growth. It's a persistent increase in both per capita income and population. And Next, I'm going to adopt Mulcair's notion of micro-invention-based economic growth, which I'm going to call pre-modern economic growth, and his macro-invention-based economic growth, uh, which I'm going to call modern economic growth. Now, this includes science, but not only. There are other things as well. So you can think of as uh, pre-modern economic growth, or as Joe Mulcair calls it, micro-invention-based economic growth. It's a type of learning by doing. Um, tinkering with an existing uh, original idea and turning it into a, a profitable enterprise. Uh, 
macro inventions are largely unprecedented and have potentially dramatic effects in, in the economy. And this is, in his opinion, uh, what set England off in the late 19th century. Um, so uh, with this general framework, pre-modern economic growth is associated with a low gr uh, growth rate of per capita income. Okay, and in England's case, this is essentially uh, the work of Crafts and Harley o over the past uh, couple decades. They've lowered what we initially thought of as England's very high growth rate from the 1750 to 1850 period. Uh, and the uh, first part of the paper quantitatively tries to make that case that the that the uh, 1750 to 1850 period has a much lower growth rate than the 1850 to 1950 period. Um, and I argue that, that uh, this also co roughly corresponds to the Song Dynasty's uh, economic growth, although we don't have any uh, GDP statistics. It's suggestive of this. Now, modern economic growth is, a, is, a, is associated with a high growth rate of per capita income. So now start thinking about late 19th century England. <clears throat> okay, so I, I hope I've made clear that uh, two things. One is uh, pre-modern economic growth, according to, to this, is something where it's a very slow uh, per capita income growth. Uh, so think of Crafts and Harley uh, in England's case. And I'm thinking the Song China's experience was, was something along these lines. Yet the market development and the transportation system development laid the framework for the subsequent modern economic growth in England's case, okay? And so in this sense, it, it's necessary. So again, uh, I argue pre-modern economic growth is necessary for modern, econ modern economic growth. Here again, I uh, point out England and, and Song China. Uh, England is uh, in this first First period in, in Song China are cases of this pre modern economic growth, very low uh, per capita growth rates, and also population growth, but uh, slow by modern economic growth standards. Uh, and England from 1850 to 1950 is a case of modern economic growth. Now, an important point here is that China didn't make the jump to modern economic growth during the Song Dynasty or shortly thereafter. That's an important question, one not addressed here. Okay. Why China did not make the jump is, 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 you know, is an important question that's not addressed here. And I'm going to focus on this pre-modern economic growth period and its, and its causal factors. Okay. So in, in a very high-speed introduction, this is where I'm going to be focusing on this early period of, of England and comparing it to China. Okay. So this is the... Uh, one of the main contributions of the paper. I'm going to quickly set the focus on this. Uh, I compare England, and in particular the 1750 to 1850 period, uh, with Song China and argue that these are both pre-modern economic growth cases. And I'm going to look for common preceding factors. Okay. The main finding uh, is that both were preceded essentially by a series of events, which I'm going to call an embryonic stage. Now first, before I give a, a definition uh, of what this creature is, let me briefly uh, tell you what uh, the timing of these things are. Okay, so for uh, both cases in, in China and, and also in England. In England, I see the embryonic stage essentially, uh, for, first let me start off and say that uh, uh, prior to this period, we see basically a Malthusian agrarian economy up to roughly around 1660, okay? Although you can't see it quite as well on the, on the graph, that's actually 1660, not 1650. And from that period to roughly around the mid 18th century, I see this embryonic stage is taking place. And in China's case, uh, it's roughly around 760. It's after the uh, uh, Anshu Rebellion, 
okay, up to the unification of, of China during the Song period. Okay, so this is the period of uh, the military warlords and the uh, uh, traumatic uh, changes that were taking place as part of this uh, Tang Song transition. And emerging from this, I see this pre-modern, uh, excuse me, I didn't change that. that, that should be economic growth, so slow rate with per capita income increases and population growth. Now, what is this? Uh, the embryonic stage can consists of four phases. First is the commercialization, the commercial urbanization of the countryside. And I'll defer some detailed explanations until I get to the graphs. I think that will be, it'll be easier. So it will be slightly unsatisfying in the, in the uh, initial introduction, uh, but I'll do it for brevity's case. Uh, so you really need to hit the countryside. No one point here is uh, urbanization has been going around since uh, the Warring States period, if not earlier. It's when these Jun and these smaller towns start appearing in the countryside that it make markets available to the large uh, portion of the population that you start to actually have uh, effects on GDP per capita, the average person's income. Second, there's improvements in the internal transportation system, okay? So rivers are cleared, canals are built, roads are improved and extended and so on and so forth. Third, uh, regional specialization in varying degrees begins, uh, begins to occur, and that in, in, involves increases in quantity and variety of consumer goods. And don't think of this in modern terms where there's, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of a region's goods are specialized and exported out of the region. This is a pre-modern area. So relative to previous periods, there's some regional specialization. Lastly, the development of markets and supporting organizations and improvements in money and credit. Okay, let me make a couple comments. These phases need not necessarily um, take place sequentially, okay? Uh, in particular, um, Excuse me, having said that, in practice, the first three phases, roughly speaking, uh, are generally sequential. However, phase four, that's the development of markets and credits, happens continuously with all three at the same time. In fact, they're intimately related. So here's a very stylized description of, uh, of these two in, in, in some graphs that will hopefully put a little flesh on this. And, uh, and uh, help convey these stylized ideas. Again, I just want to emphasize these are stylized. Uh, they're not based on, on primary sources of checking roads and, and canals and so on and so forth. Uh, but I've spoken with some experts like Nanny Kim on uh, transportation, and at least in the Song Dynasty's case, uh, it's a ballpark rough estimation, okay? But the, the point is here, is to get the main idea across, okay? Uh, and uh, Eric Jones has is, is argued similar things for England uh, uh, around this time in the earlier period here. Okay, so let's f first take a look at the Song China. So first of all, this Malthusian agrarian economy, roads and cities are nothing new to China. They've been around for thousands of years, okay? You've got the capital, uh, regional uh, hubs and main roads. When Qin unified the, the empire, the, there they were paved roads and so on. This is there's no new technology here. What characterized this this Malthusian agrarian economy was that these roads typically went to areas uh, that were fertile in order to feed the court, or to dangerous military regions. Okay, so these were big thick arteries. Uh, not only the ones that are drawn here, but uh, to m dangerous military areas that threaten the country, and also to feed the uh, capital and provincial areas. So there are a collection of arteries that were basically administrative related for fiscal and military reasons. Now what's different, after the An Lushan Rebellion, you start to see many Jun popping up. Jun is the uh, Chinese term for basically a small city or a small town. Uh, in particular, they are originally uh, military garrisons. 
and uh, they established themselves and they began to uh, appeal to commercial activities, in particular taxing them. Excise taxes were, were collected. And the second phase began where the transportation system locally began to develop, okay? Uh, and hubs began to emerge, uh, specialized uh, towns uh, in Gent would appear and they would uh, specialize in, in marketing and uh, trans collecting and transporting uh, goods for certain destinations. And finally, we have a national market by around the 11th century. Now, this includes canals, roads, and uh, rivers, and so forth. And again, this is just a stylized picture. Lastly, a degree of regional specialization. Uh, iron is up in the northeast. Tea is in Sichuan and on the south. Uh, certain, uh, my favorite, lychee nuts in Fujian began to become famous uh, in, in certain areas in the country, and so on. And again, markets and supporting organizations continuously develop along with these three phases. So England, very quickly, uh, Caesar set foot on this island and there were roads and capitals back then. There's nothing new about that. Uh, so this Malthusian agrarian economy before uh, 1660 was, uh, was around. Roads were built again uh, to dangerous military areas or to regions that would feed the, uh, 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 the royalty or the uh, administrative centers. But then around the Restoration, you start to see some new towns starting to appear. Unincorporated towns begin to, to become established around here, uh, especially up in the northeast and down in the southeast around the, some of the port cities. They started clearing rivers. And also, uh, as the transportation system improved, it began with stagecoach roads and unifying, standardizing the stagecoaches, okay? So this is kind of an unsexy uh, uh, development of the transportation system before the railroads ever even appear. So this is around the 1670s and the 1680s, okay? And then uh, regional, uh, the, uh, the transportation system continues to develop. And eventually you get to the turnpike system, okay? This is kind of the culmination of the development of the transportation system that's, that's better well known. A degree of regional specialization appears uh, uh, to an extent. And lastly, again, this, this uh, uh, fourth phase, the development of markets and supporting institutions, the Bank of England, uh, credit, uh, things like this start to appear, the monetization of the economy. Is going on all at the same time, in intimately related with these with these three phases. So, in conclusion, to, to wrap it up rather quickly, so when addressing this main causal factor of what causes pre-modern growth, these both these two episodes show uh, quite similar phases before them, in my view. Uh, the uh, the towns, the transportation system, some regional development, and so on. And I think maybe what we should be focusing on is what caused this early uh, urbanization in the countryside, this commercial urbanization. Why, why all of a sudden are these towns and unincorporated towns popping up in England? Why are all these Zhen popping up throughout China uh, in the late Tang and the Five Dynasties period? Uh, so the point of the paper is, is not to provide an answer, but try and focus the question a little bit tighter and say, well, uh, what should be looking for and when? Well, in Song China, it's going to be right around the uh, time of the um, Anshu Rebellion, uh, and in England, right around the Restoration. Uh, and so this is the conclusion. The conclusion leads to a hopefully a, a more focused question uh, for those that are interested in what, what caused this uh, pre-modern growth, this low growth rate and population growth. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Professor uh, William Guang Lingyo will be my discussant. Well, uh, uh, to be honest, I'm not uh, qualified to comment on this paper. I'm most, uh, as uh, most of my work uh, focus on the historical research, and I'm trained in the history department. 
Uh, but however, uh, I'm I'm also inspired by by Ruang's uh, writing and you know uh, his uh, uh, he's a great teacher with uh, inspiration. Um, very persuade, persuaded his student in Tamakan University uh, to engage the debate on the historical uh, issues, economic history research. All these things uh, can be fully uh, reflected in his writing of this paper. Uh, and uh, I have uh, uh, no uh, major disagreement with him on this theoretical issue. He discussed here is basically uh, an argument on a prolonged pre-modern or early modern economic growth. Um, so I would focus my comment on the structure on the writing issue. Uh, uh, it's, it seems uh, it seems like a dialogue between uh, the writing. You know, the, uh, reading the paper that makes me often confused. Then I realize it's actually a dialogue between Kuznets and Edwards. Uh, as uh, we s uh, research uh, in economic history, we all you know the descendants, we are students of Kuznets, right? Uh, but however, uh, few researchers would uh, uh, so inspired by Kuznets, the, this uh, framework, his theoretical, f not only his theoretical framework, but all his ideas um, as and wrong is so basically he in every part of his paper it's a it's a long research paper covered so many fields and it's not about Sun China in particular actually it's like a, a, a narrative about uh, girls theory uh, in Kuznet's style and it's a further critique uh, his revision on Kuznet's uh, argument, uh, words, vocabulary, even down to the level of the vocabulary. Um, so I would uh, suggest that Ruan address the issue directly, rather, rather than you claim you make an empirical research between Shung China and uh, uh, England, as you, you can't, you know, pay much attention to the Song case in particular central, say one suggestion if you do, you should analyze the Song data um, in the different area and come across century by century. Um, and, uh, and one thing is uh, you're picky to Kuznets uh, to a certain degree uh, you almost uh, on every, uh, not only the framework, the framework, you know, you made, I see this uh, a very great, uh, uh, it, it's helpful, it's very helpful to read the paper that you address the reader all the latest uh, scholarship about the failure of the first industrial revolution, right? The low economic growth and its strong connection to the economic development in pre-industrial world rather than the connection to the, you know, this, uh, different feature in comparison to the Industrial Revolution in the 18th, 19th century. We all, we have this knowledge, uh, we all owe it to the research by revisionist scholarship, uh, like the uh, Kreft's research, all these things. And uh, and also the uh, John Mokyo you just mentioned, you generalize them very well. Um, but I, I think it's a little bit too far, you basically you try to uh, criticize or you know every word uh, Kuznets used there like the modern when you say well uh, it's not the modern economic growth as Kuznets suggested uh, then you should modern economic growth basically means that this way this is the direction blah 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 uh, I I just checked you know this not all of pages I found all the keyword you give a double meaning. Uh, then you actually, you set your reader your trap, right? Um, but, then, but still, I like the narrative. It's, uh, it can be, uh, my suggestion is, you probably can turn it into a book, a good textbook, 
that you know uh, we can use in our economic history classroom to attract the student, you know, to uh, get more interest there, uh, engaged in the debate, and get in more interested, right, in the economic history issue. Uh, not only about China, not only about uh, England, but about the uh, pre-modern or early modern world, right, in general. Uh, I will stop here. Um, you know, scholars, uh, probably like Dr. Deng, can tell more specific, as you promised. <laughs> Next, uh, we have uh, Kojiro uh, Taguchi from Osaka University. My presentation. Oh, yes, the minus one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Time is limited, so let's start it. Hello, everyone. My name is Kojiro Taguchi. I come from uh, Osaka University. So, uh, let's, for, uh, let's start from the, this topic. In, 20, in 2010, it was reported that GDP of the, of the PRC surpasses that of Japan. This news uh, soon became a sensation, sensation among the Japan media and had a huge effect on the national um, psyche. It may seem funny that we, that we made so much uh, fuss over recent China's ascent in the world GDP ranking by simple arithmetic when the population of the PRC approximately 10 times as large as that of Japan, the equivalence in the size of the national economy only means that output per capita of the former is one-tenth um, as much as that of Japan. What is, a, what is the matter with it? The psychological strong impact Japanese people experienced when the PRC's GDP surpassed that of Japan in itself could be both a sign of Japanese excessively high evaluation for uh, themselves ever since 1950s rapid growth era or even before the uh, 19th, 19th century and and the persist persistent low estimate for Chinese economic potential in other words in, in other words our um, our understanding is historically path de dependent even when we see uh, statistical um, phenomena like economic growth. Exactly from this viewpoint, I have a strong interest in conditions of, of, of economic growth and development, as well as connotation of and uh, the relationship between um, the terms of growth and development. By reviewing uh, the recent studies on the Chinese economy, economic history, in this presentation, I dig into the manner in which we treat economic dynam dynamics of China, and especially um, in which history is drawn. What needs to be quest questioned here does not merely lie in the um, concrete evidences uh, seen as representing the dynamical uh, processes of its economy, but also in the lo logical sphere in which we analyze, evaluate, and discuss this dy dynamism. So uh, at first, I outline the background of, the of which the development or the growth and growth is discussed, and then touch upon the recent scholarship on the Chinese economic growth in the long run. Uh, finally, I will explore how we can and how we cannot mm, explain the dynamical processes of China's economy, especially in the context of the comparative history. So, uh, for the for the avoidance of needless needless confusion, we have to make a minimal definition as to what exactly mm, the terms of development and growth mean. In a broad sense, economic growth is the trend of sequential increase shown by and defined by numerical indices, whether it be Solovian and Smithian growth. In contrast, economic development 
um, connotes a dynamical and a transformative process in which a certain society con um, society undergoes a qualitative, revolutionary, and the transformative and staged change. Staged change. This sort of um, this sort of, of a qualitative and staged change is uh, notably in Marxist and the Weberian con context, often seen as an exclusive feature of history of history of the West. After the collapse of the Cold War regime, the premises of thinking about the economic development have been seriously undermined, along with the shift in the world politics and the increasing awareness of environmental finitude and ever-growing trend towards rethinking modernity. So thus, many of the theorists of Chinese history have been trying to switch the focal issue from Eurocentric models of economic development to more neutral categories such as the market economy, which was flourish, flourishing ever during the imperial period, and to the economic growth as arithmetic, arithmetic sum of it. Uh, with this shift, economic historians have been increasingly centering upon the quantitative, quantitative issues. This may be due to the remarkable advancement, advancement in the field of ec economics and quantitative history. At the same time, equally important is that the development of cryometrics has helped and partly at least benefited from an um, ever-expanding narrative of global historiography. Recent scholarship um, has been increasingly focusing on the quantitative uh, issues such as demographic change in level of living and agricultural productivity in non-Western countries during the pre-modern period. And that's trying to reveal non-Western countries during, uh, sorry, uh, to reveal non-West dynamism of commercialization outside the West, sometimes as a background of the industrialization and capitalization in no Northwestern Europe. The world historical statistics compiled by the um, expert in national income accounts, the late Angus Madison, without doubt, have encouraged the debate over the global economic history. In short, we are increasingly aware that we cannot underestimate the, the impact of extensive economic growth on the dynamisms in global sphere. So uh, I plot the Madison's world GDP statistics on line chart. It is cr clearly shown that the story of economic growth is, depends on the length of time scale. For example, um, before the early 19th century, contrary to the conventional image, the economy of the China was far greater in size than that of the West, except for the southern for around the 1700. And the gross output of China always doubled that of Western European countries. So this may engender three-tiered interpretations. At first, takeoffs in the West were um, short-lived and phenomenal. And the recent expansion of the PRC's economy strongly indicates that it has been recovering its appropriate place in the global economy. On the other hand, the size of the Chinese economy merely represents its huge population, and in per capita terms, its average productivity um, has long stagnated. This position has been recently challenged by Kenneth Pomerantz, uh, citing statistical figures in the lower Yanzhou. Third, these two positions are not necessarily mutually exclusive, given that the experience of the West may have been something unique the trajectory, uh, trajectory of China's economic growth is even normal. And the normality has its, uh, has its region in the present PRC's economy, as being one put it. In the end, great divergence, di divergence debate has been stalled by a dispute over the implication of uniqueness and normality, or unique normality, um, by Pamela Kyle Cross's phrase, if ever. So what, what, what is my um, position as to this debate? A, the statistical basis for China's pre-modern economic growth is hardly robust, as economic historians may suppose. Especially the demog demographic data, HUKO, which only represented the, the uh, proxy indicator of the government of fiscal revenue. The problem is that 
when we aggregate the national count, whether in its total sum or in per, per, per capita terms, may inevitably engender uh, amendable errors. Thus, Madison statistics um, only provides us with a good sense of scale in terms of Tom Piketty. And this position is not to reject the value of the official statistics of the imperial China. Rather, official statistics in China is more useful when utilized as indices of medium term, or namely less than 200 years demographic change and its regional variance in, in limited area. Uh, let me take an uh, instance. Uh, in recent, recent work, I have examined the population and arable acreage statistics of North China, seen in the mean official records. By using um, the world's hierarchical clustering method, found a specific regional or pro provincial pattern in population growth, increase of arable acreage and farm size in, in area around Beijing. And this um, pattern um, exactly co coincides with, interestingly, approx approximately with the topo topographical settings in this area. In short, only in Western Hebei, a relatively, um, well, relatively level in intensive agricultural production was developed. If this model is in the capital area were to be buried, it may also well, well exemplify the value and the utility of offshore statistics of mean population. That is to say, it suggests a possible credibility of offshore figure, especially in its relative value used as what represents a chronological change in regional variation, not figure itself. See, and when we acknowledge that the stat statistical data in national level is not so credible, we, um, we all the more have to re-evaluate the Kenneth Pomeran's story, not only his ex explanation for the great divergence, uh, but, the, but that he shifted the unit, unit of comparison from uh, national level to uh, region, that is, the low and the why is then this able to comp compare the economic growth just between China and England, but inevitably enlarge the frame of comparison into a national level, uh, China and England, or East and West? Actually, as plentiful sinologists have pointed out, the size, non-uniformity, and uh, inequality of the present PRC are like no other. For, it, for instance, 10 years ago, total output of each provincial level administrative unit ranked with much of uh, other Asian countries, and its disparity in terms of gross, out, uh, gross output and per capita product between regions was nearly tenfold. And moreover, historically, uh, and the trajectory of uh, extensive economic growth varied even among the broadest geographical divisions of China, say uh, North China and uh, South China. Considering compar uh, comparably higher level of per, per capita output in the southern, southern provinces, disparity between the South and North should have been more remarkable. So at last, so the problem is, in which case and then to what extent the national level analysis is appropriate and effective. Recent scholarship has been increasingly focusing on institutions of China. More often than that, which ever the conclusion, local experiences are extended to as much as national level. This is partly because governmental or former institution is opposed with the private and the informal institution conventional custom, both of which are equally seen as something provides individual incentive structures, or at worst, in the terminology of a past sinologist, which suffocated the social development. Thus, institutional approach is nothing but another, another expression of uh, Asiatic society, I think so. While the, while the institutional approach is a sophisticated analytical tool, Mm, and has been applied worldwide and in cross-disciplinary arguments, in terms with, with the Chinese econ economic history, it's a pity that comparative analysis has been exclusively centered upon issues of uh, national level. Therefore, 
uh, it is needed to construct a multi-dimensional model to uh, explain how Chinese institutions arose, evolved, and coexisted, as well as how they are re reinterpreted by contemporaries and by ourselves. At least, we have to um, distinguish between state institution and informal one. The relationship between them is not that one evolves into another, just as uh, Douglas Noss uh, uh, put it. But rather that both evolve through reciprocal influences. influences. That is stay, and that is to say state institution, written law or regulation, etc., and normal informal one. And social nexus, con contractual custom, are different tiers of institutional structure with different games in accordance with the different rules. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, Tagushi-san's paper deals with uh, economic development of the early modern China, as its title shows. But its main argument is not about the economic development of the early, early modern China path, uh, for example, how and why Chinese economy developed in the long run, but about the concern and methodology that have guided <coughs> uh, previous research on that is issue. Uh, in this sense, Tagushi-san's uh, paper urges us to make methodological reflection as well as to discuss China's economic history directly. Uh, as uh, Tagushi's paper points out, the teleological development models based on the historical experience of uh, Europe have lost its power during these several decades and less uh, Eurocentric models which focus on more neutral barometers concerning quantitative growth have come to be accepted by more and more economic historians in the world. Uh, Japanese uh, economic historians have long been interested in population and land statistics uh, compiled by Chinese dynasties and tried to critically analyze the characteristics of these materials but they paid little attention to the Dwight Parkins type of, Dwight Parkins type of research, uh, which estimates the macroeconomic trends in Chinese history in the long run. It was perhaps uh, partly because uh, Japanese historians were not brave enough to make aggregating or av averaging estimates like GDP or per capita GDP based on the scattered data available in historical materials. And it was also partly because they did not feel much reality in nationwide and long-term estimates, as not only the regional disparities uh, gap between the rich and poor, uh, but also short-term short -term economic fluctuations were so salient in a pre-modern China. <laughs> uh, I'm not... Um, uh, I'm not argue, arguing that uh, quantitative analysis are not so useful in search on pre-modern Chinese economy. For example, as some kind of quantitative figures such as grain prices uh, were easily known by contemporary observers. We can uh, construct a relatively reliable time series data of grain prices during the Qin using the materials based on contemporary people's uh, direct observance. The contemporary people is subjective and ambiguous, but still very important in the studies of economic history. Uh, for example, let us look at the economic conditions uh, in the late, late mean. Uh, from the quantitative point of view, late mean is generally considered as a period of economic growth uh, when per move output increased and the standard of living also improved, at least uh, in the uh, southeast regions. But as historians who have read uh, late mean uh, local materials all know, 
Let me intellectuals, intellectuals anonymously lamented the heavy tax burden and rural poverty and looked back to the happy and stable lives of a hundred years before. This evidence suggests that the increase in the late mean output may not be the consequence of the natural increase in the um, uh, natural economic growth, but may be the result of the expansion of military expenditure and increase, uh, increasing uh, tax burden paid in silver. The state finances, uh, as an actor with compelling power, uh, would assert a strong influence on economy, uh, sometimes bringing people forcefully into uh, market transactions and subside, sub, subsidiary industry. Uh, the importance of state finances and the growth of market economy can be observed not only in the late mean, uh, but also in the some period, uh, as Professor Kenton suggests. <coughs> Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the remarkable uh, regional disparities <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. a remarkable reg regional disparities uh, in Chinese economy, <coughs> contemporary as well as historical, are not only caused by the differences in productivity but also related to the nationwide socio-political structure. Uh, uh, one of the um, Tagus' main points is related to these uh, disparities. He dem demonstrates that we should adopt not the whole of China, but a more limited area as a unit of analysis. Uh, his, study, his study on uh, 15th to 16th centuries Hebei is uh, persuasive, and I agree with him that nationwide averages are not so meaningful. At the same time, however, I, st I still think that the whole of China is useful as a unit of analysis. Uh, considering the importance of state finances and the common patterns in economic behavior shared, by, uh, shared through uh, linguistic uh, sameness, it would be uh, still useful to analyze economic trends from mm. the nationwide perspective. <coughs> Uh, Tagusan also uh, criticizes an es essentialist approach included in some works uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, of uh, com comparative institutional analysis, uh, which emphasizes certain homogeneous and unchangeable characteristics in China as a whole. Uh, I agree with his remarks that this type of essentialist analysis somewhat resembles the Asiatic society theory in the uh, 19th and cent uh, 20th centuries. He also criticizes uh, Abner Greif's uh, no notion uh, in his paper that uh, uh, Chinese grants were a main uh, hindrance to investments to scientific improvements. According to Tagushi-san, uh, clan organizations uh, showed only a limited dis distribution in China. I think uh, this criticism is reasonable too. Uh, but as Taguchi san himself notes, the uh, concept of in institution and the comparative inst institutional analysis is not necessarily so simple as to assume that uh, institutions prevail homogeneously within one country. <coughs> Uh, in 1949, uh, Muramatsu Yuji, a, a Japanese economist, uh, published a book entitled The Social System of Chinese Economy. In this book, he de developed a method which somewhat resembled today's uh, institutional analysis. He compared the dynamics of contemporary Chinese, uh, Chinese economy to games, uh, which was unique to uh, China. Uh, according, him, according to him, uh, quantitative achievement of the economy is the score of the game. And a state laws, system of government, a social norms, a shared mentalities, etc., uh, the, are the rules of the game. And economic organization, for example, partnerships, putting out system, and so on, uh, formed by people according to uh, circumstances are the uh, tactics adopted by players in the process of the game. 
Uh, players can choose their tactics in a flexible way according to circumstances, so their behaviors may differ with uh, localities, with periods, and with uh, situations. Nevertheless, they can be regarded as players of the same game organized with rather stable rules shared by uh, themselves. Uh, if you could follow Murama's suggestion and uh, consider clans, uh, as one of the uh, tactics chosen by Chinese people, we, we might be able to understand both of nationwide commonness and local diversity in a certain consistent way. Uh, anyway, essentialist method of comparative history has become uh, overdated today, or outdated today. At the same time, uh, though a purely quantitative approach without qualitative analysis may not be very attractive. If we could uh, combine qualitative and quantitative approach, approaches to uh, construct flexible and falsifiable models uh, in the uh, in words of uh, Karl Popper, uh, they would bring fruitful results. A uh, multifaceted comparison, uh, for example, comparison not only with the West, but also with Turkey, Japan, etc., uh, will help, help us elaborate these models too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, the, my actual title uh, is a little bit different uh, from uh, the former title. So we, uh, uh, we need to add uh, uh, infant the before the mortality. <laughs> so, uh, so this change is very small, but uh, very important because uh, I, I'm talking about uh, uh, not uh, the m uh, macro relationship between uh, population and economy in Tokyo, Japan, but I'm talking about uh, uh, touching on uh, the microscopic so, relation between the babies and the mothers in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, my paper so considers uh, the effect of uh, the economic development of Tokugawa uh, 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 Japan. Uh, that is uh, so uh, urbanization and rural industrializations as a phenomenon on both fertility and infant mortality, so which are close so related to each other through the health of pregnant, uh, pregnant peasant mothers who engaged in not only agriculture and household jobs, but by employment of rural uh, household industries. But what we should think about here is how uh, Tokugawa peasant negotiated uh, with uh, a drudgery or uh, this utility of labor uh, to keep the health of mothers and babies. So as you know, the historical demography of fertility in Tokugawa Japan, uh, especially for comparative studies, uh, should be based on the estimation of infant mortalities uh, because most of Tokugawa population registers were lacking. So almost all the information of infant missed during one year after birth. So as the previous studies showed, <coughs> Uh, the Tokugawa marital fertility was uh, at a moderate uh, levels compared to the same dem demographic stage of European countries, so which was equivalent of 70 to 80 percent of European average. The other characteristics of Tokugawa fertility were uh, first, uh, their reproductive behaviors are spacing rather than stopping. But it is not sure uh, their motivation was intentional or spontaneous and then natural. The second, uh, the approximate determinants of fertility were frequency and length of breastfeeding, uh, a degree of spontaneous uh, stillbirth, and uh, permanent uh, sterility, not the quarter frequency. Thus, so the stru uh, structure change of regional fertility patterns. Uh, would be happened uh, by the end of 19th centuries, uh, which showed from low fertility in East and high fertility in West of Tokugawa period to uh, high uh, East and low West of modern Japan. 
The infant size of Tokugawa Japan was likely to happen as a limited and more backward areas. They frequently received the damages of farming and drought during the war uh, Tokugawa period, such as deep Tohoku region. Uh, to know why the fertility is so moderate, so primarily we have to, uh, just a moment, yes. So to know why the fertility is so moderate, so primarily we have to think about the higher degree of labor intensity of peasant women, especially done as the agricultural field, adding to their uh, basic uh, householding activities. Uh, since the age of their independence, so between uh, late 16th century and early 17th centuries. But observing the uh, trend of regional marital fertility until the late uh, Tokuga era, we have less chance to see the drastic change not only in Western Japan, but in Eastern Japan. Also, so many regional agricultural development uh, had been happened in Japan during the same period. If it is so, so, we have to pay attention to another factors uh, which uh, made multiple fertility moderate regardless of region in Japan. So my paper so tentatively uh, so pointed out to the effect from the infectious disease, especially from the sexually transmitted uh, disease, STD, uh, such as syphilis and gonorrhea. So which would had uh, been uh, spreading intensively all part of Japan during the Tokuga period. The traditionally, so it is uh, depending on the anecdotal evidences, but most recently the paleodemography of Tokuga Japan and finding out the scientific evidence that the almost half of the adult male population of Edo, presently uh, Tokyo, were infected by any kind of syphilis. So my paper shows uh, Yes. Well, my paper shows the uh, higher mobility of syphilis at the age 20 male population of modern Japan uh, using the historical documents of uh, syphilis investigated at the time of uh, physical examination for conscription. The about 3% to 4% mobility of syphilis at the age 20 male population of the early 20th century Japan would easily expect to be uh, rising to more than 40 uh, to 50% uh, at age 50 uh, male population. So needless to say, so the effect was not limited to male population. The degree of spread of STD would be so high and extensive, driven by heavy migration as a process of urbanization. But the most important was st uh, STD was not acute, uh, fatal uh, disease, but chronic one with which people live together by taking medicine and uh, uh, doing folk, uh, folk remedies uh, passed down from ancient to the Tonga peoples. So besides STDs, we have to worry about the effect from uh, smallpox, uh, which was well known to be the most spread uh, and longest survival disease in the history of Japan and especially uh, gave heavy damage to infant and uh, child populations. So these clinical uh, diseases always did big uh, damage to the society concerned. The going to the late uh, Tokuga period, the proto-industrialization appears as the world of Japan uh, with constant support from each uh, local Han domain government. Uh, this movement would be likely to bring uh, the drastic change into ordinary rural scene, uh, including the level of trend of fertilities uh, since the late 19th century. Uh, if uh, the rise of fertility was uh, coincide with the improvement of standard living, uh, at the same time, we have to think about it from the viewpoint of infant mortality as index of uh, baseline uh, living standards as shown by the uh, uh, Human Development Index. Uh, that is, during the Tokuga period, the fertility and infant mortality seem to be uh, the two sides of the same coin uh, based on the argument of baseline standard living. The major government promoted the basic uh, development policies, uh, course, which means the irrigation and uh, the powerful cultivations, so resulting in the higher uh, land productivities. 
So about, about uh, uh, small but uh, steady change of fertility and infant mortality, that which resulted in the uh, structural change of regional fertility patterns of modern Japan, happened by the 1920s. So it means as for the fertility levels, Eastern uh, Japan uh, surpassed uh, the uh, Western Japan, which was a uh, reverse relation in Tokuga period. The, my paper uh, uh, choice Amori Prefecture's northern edge of uh, mainland Japan, a typical area of economic backwardness of modern Japan, to know the effect of uh, economic development on the improvement of infant mortality. Both uh, the introduction of irrigation system and uh, rural crop production into Aomori peasant villages uh, brought about the decline of infant mortality through decreasing labor intensity of pregnant uh, peasant women. So moreover, it probably contributed to the decline of stillbirth and miscarriage uh, by the improvement of physical condition of peasant women, so which lastly resulted in the rise of fertility. The similar mechanism of reducing uh, infant mortality and rising fertility was likely to exist as a uh, uh, peasant household. So because uh, Tokuga peasant experienced the similar process of rural industrialization, so where the putting out system was introduced and uh, the peasant uh, used their traditional level technology to get monetary income. So lastly, so these peasant reaction towards urbanization and rural industrialization were uh, based on um, their unique economic be behaviors, the so name is subjective equi equi equilibrium, so which was originally uh, speculated by the, uh, uh, Alexander Chayanov so, and later uh, developed by uh, Chihiro Nakajima at Osaka and Kyoto University Economist. Uh, as engaging, uh, engaging with non-agricultural activities to get monetary income, the peasant usually change their reallocation re of their family labor uh, toward substantive agriculture or market-oriented production due to thinking about the balance of their subjective utility of self-consumed products and monetary income and their uh, disutility of labor. As of observing the Japan's peasant behaviors, so roughly speaking, both the decreasing of uh, work uh, intensity of female worker and increasing monetary income made a uh, great contribution to the rise of fertility and the decline of infant mortality. The rather, uh, the improvement of uh, landed economy, uh, such as uh, irrigation, firstly uh, introduced uh, the decreasing, uh, decreasing of work intensity and labor disuse utility to uh, uh, female peasant workers, and then the monetary income effect assisted the tendency to reach the structural change of regional fertility and the drastic decline of infant mortality in modern Japan. Thank you very much. So I've known Professor Tomobi for several years. He was my host when I first came to Japan, and so I'm, I'm a friendly discussant in this regard. One thing that I want to note is that, to a large extent, a lot of the paper is a survey paper in the sense that there's a lot of work that went into this paper that uh, is not described in depth in the, in the paper itself. And, and actually, Ken, Kenichi doesn't talk too much about the techniques he's using in the paper, so I'm going to emphasize some of those a little bit more than he did. Um, so he's been working on some of these issues for 25 years, uh, I think a 1991 paper, is that the first one? Okay, so one of the things about this and what he's known for in his research has been to do a lot of regional and provincial and local collections of data for wages and interest rates and a variety of these kind of things. And so what's truly impressive about a lot of the work here is that he's actually using not just some national aggregate that's composed from some number you get out there, he's actually creating the natural, national aggregate, or he's making comparisons based on kind of building up from a lower level. Um, so he collects a lot of local information about births and infant deaths throughout Japan. Then he works to compare the fertility and infant mortality rates. And he's actually, the, 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 I think the, the new change here is basically talking about uh, the intensity of work and how that influences both fertility rates and infant mortality. 
And then he also ties this to venereal disease and sexually transmitted diseases. So here are the key results. He said this before. Uh, some of the results from earlier is that Japan's fertility is lower than it is in Europe. In the 18th and 19th century, there are more abortions, there's more infertility, and there are longer periods between births. And longer periods between births might be the dominant feature. Uh, Japan's fertility is higher than in England after 1900, although there's a big worry about Japan's fertility declining in Japan during this time frame. So then there's also comparisons between Eastern versus Western Japan. Uh, there's a shift in relative fertility, and the East is lower in the 18th and 19th century, and it flips, and they become higher in the, in the, after around 1925. Um, I think that the, the real key here is the stuff on work intensity. And so there's a, there's a kind of a verbal description of a household model and household work intensity. The introduction of cottage industry, he argues, is actually lowering the intensity of work relative to what you do in agriculture. And so what that means is, is that the woman has more time to take care of the children, and thus is are likely to lower infant mortality, and they're also able to have more children at the same time. Uh, one of the things he didn't talk about is the regression analysis. Um, he shows that the in a regression analysis across a number of regions, uh, he shows that this is the results are consistent with the prediction and that more labor intensity is tied to higher infant mortality rates and more cottage industry is tied to lower infant mortality rates. Then the final thing is the uh, sexually transmitted disease. I found this to be very interesting. He's talking about various uh, legal changes in prostitution across these various locations and that influences how many people are coming in. There's a, there's a lot of migration that's going across and, and a lot of the venereal disease seems to be transmitted by people moving from different districts. Um, so I have some suggestions for improvement. Uh, it'd be useful to have more definition of key variables. The M versus M is described. It's a cold me measure. But actually, this is what he did in 1991. So I, I, I don't know if he really needs to mention M and M. He can just talk about spacing versus, versus uh, the size. It would be really useful to know more about the size and the breadth of the panels. I wasn't quite clear as to how many observations there were in terms of the number of provinces or districts being compared. It would also be able to use whether know if this is a panel or a cross-section. Uh, one of the things, if it is a panel, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about what happens if you include uh, ge geographic fixed effects or year fixed effects in the panel. Uh, in my experience, a lot of times that kind of eliminates a lot of effects that show up just in a, in a cross-section or in a, in a, in a pooled panel. Um, and then there were some times where there's one study uh, that was Ayama district, I think, that's limited. It's limited to this one district over a period of time. It's actually an important piece of the paper. And it wasn't clear to me why it was just focused on that. Maybe it was lack of data. Maybe it'd be useful to know those kind of things. And I have one last request. I, went, I was a PhD student at the University of Washington. And so one of my professors was Kozo Yamamura. I had another professor there, Susan Hanley, and they actually wrote a book about fertility and stuff, and it's night cited in the, in the paper. And so I think that for, for my own alma mater, I've got to ask you to cite, cite them in the, in the paper and stuff. Because they actually, they, Susan Hanley and, and Carl Moss wrote a whole series of papers in the, in the 70s in pop studies about, about these issues. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. We'd like to report the long-term changes of interest rate in the cre in credit and loan markets and the economic development during the Tokuga period. Historical research on both European and Japanese proto-industrialization has pointed out that rural industrialization played an important role for the subsequent economic growth. Both the improvement of market quality and the growth of market infrastructure contributed much to the successful transition to modern capitalism. This presentation shows the improvement of rural credit market during the Tokuga period from 1620s to 1860s using interest rate as economic index. 
The data of interest rate used in this presentation are calculated from the historical documents of loan contracts happened during the Tokuga period from the, from the early 17th century to the middle of the 19th century. This picture shows the sample of loan contract documents Choshu domain of Tokuga period. These include many kinds of information on the loan and credit contracts, such as, the borrow such as names of the borrowers, the lenders, and guarantors, the amount of money loaned, the interest rates, the mortgage, and some measures taking on default, and so on. First, we analyze the quality improvement of the land market from the viewpoint of levels of interest rate calculated from the land lease market in the early modern Japan. Figure 1 shows the changes of interest rates of land market in early modern Japan from 1620s to 1860s. The interest rate from the middle of the 18th century clearly decreased as the demand of the funds for proto-industries and, and by employment by peasants increased. In such a situation, the issue of local note played an important role. In early modern Japan, the gold, silver, bronze currencies with the, which the shogunate issued were basic currencies, but the lack of money supply is a serious problem. The local note was issued as territorial policy to solve this problem by each domain. In the, in the 18th century, as the commercial production became active, the chance using the local note increased, and, and the local note was circulating stability. In this way, the local note spread over all the territory of the domains. The interest rate in the land lease market among the peasants decreased by proving the peasants' demand for the funds. Next, we analyze the relationship between the improvement of the credit market and the proto industrialization. Figure 2 depicts the relationship between the averages of interest rate from 1841 to 1868 and the proportion of proto-industrial production to the total production of 1874 by province named during the Tokuga period, most of which correspond to peasant uh, present-day prefecture. There is a clear negative correlation between them at the total sample, which is statistically significant. It means that in the rural part of Tokuga period, land lease market for small capital funding functioned well, corresponding to peasants' need. As Table 1 shows, by observing the provinces with a sample size of more than 10, these provinces, such as, such as Musashi, Izumi, and Kawachi, had lower averages of interest rates, about 10%, and at higher proportion of proto-industrial production, more than 40%. Most of peasants in these areas made a living not only by producing agricultural products, but also by engaging in proto-industrial production and by employment since the 19th century. On the other hand, Mutsu and Dewa were famous for abundant rice crop and their interest rates were about 20% in the middle of the 19th century. At the same time, the proportion of proto-industrial production in these areas was less than 30%. It means that these areas were suitable for rice cropping as compared to other regions, and the peasants in these areas earned more income by producing agricultural products rather than by engaging in the proto-industrial products by employment. The last part of the presentation provides the part of research result from the case study of one of the typical domains of Tokuga proto-industrialization, Choshu Domain, located at the west edge of mainland and famous as one of strong leaders of Meiji restoration, 
長州ドメイン is Suo Province and Nagato Province. Among many domains of Tokuga period, the Choshu domain was famous for attaining the successful proto industrialization during the late Tokuga period from the late 18th century to the middle of the 19th century. The Choshu peasants had been engaging in cotton textile weaving, vegetable wax producing, and paper making since the end of the 17th century. The profit coming from the production highly contributed to the financial basis of the Choshu domain. Figure 3 shows the changes of interest rate of the loan market in the areas of Choshu domain from 1701 to 1868. The annual changes of interest rate of the domain tended to be decreasing as same as the case of the whole Japan. It seems that the reason for the interest rate decline came from especially the stable or increasing supply of local note. The Choshu domain, some additional supplies of local note happened four times during the Tokuga period. In the 19th century, since the supply of local note by the domain increased, with the development of the real economy, the value of local note seemed to be stable. As a result, the interest rate also came to be stable. Next, we consider the relationship between the loan and the development of proto-industrial production using the example of peasant vegetable wax makers. The vegetable wax makers borrowed some money for transporting their products to northern part of Japan. This production was controlled by the domain monopoly system where not uh, sorry, the vegetable wax makers borrowed some money for transporting uh, <laughs> sorry, I repeat it. Their products to the northern part of Japan. The, the, uh, this production was controlled by the domain monopoly system where not only the materials of vegetable wax were exclusively controlled are corrected, but also the production of vegetable wax was controlled by the domain. In addition, the domain encouraged the peasants to sell their vegetable wax to consumers of the other provinces. But since there was a time lag between their production and selling, the peasants who produced them used the land lease loan to obtain the funds for their production. As we can understand from the above example, the loan, loan markets were effectively utilized for proto-industrial production by peasants. The volume of loan market enlarged as the late Tokuga period approached. As having previous research on the loan and credit market of Tokuga period, we can clearly show the two important results First, the, in the interest rate from the middle of the 17th century to the middle of the 19th century had clearly decreased. The demand for money funds in the rural Japan had been expanded since the early Tokuga period, and consequently, loan and credit market were improved, and then the interest rate also steadily decreased. Second, there is a significant negative correlation between the averages of interest rate from 1841 to 1868 and the proportion of proto-industrial production to the total production of 1874. Some areas where the interest rate were decreased at the middle of the 19th century were in the easy access to credit and loan markets, and moreover, their funds were utilized for investing to proto-industrial production, such as the case of the Choshu domain. We would like to conclude our presentation. Thank you for listening.
this. Oh. So the time is late. I will try to be very uh, brief. Let, you heard the uh, conclusion. There are two main conclusions from this paper which is that interest rates fell over uh, time in the Tokugawa period and that the regions undergoing proto-industrialization seem to have benefited particularly from that kind of fall in the interest rates. These, uh, these conclusions to me seem very sensible, uh, uh, but I just want to provide some suggestions to try to help the authors make them stronger. So the authors present their results in uh, the form of interest rates which are averaged over periods of about 20 years. And that's a, it, this kind of averaging is very sensible uh, strategy. Um, but they need to worry about uh, sample selection in their, uh, in their data. Um, now the, the overall uh, trend in interest rates is based on a lot of different studies done by different scholars. And so they probably cannot do very much about the sample selection problems in that part of their paper. Um, but the Choshu domain study is based on microdata. And as you saw from the document that uh, 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 Ms. Tanaka uh, put up, um, it's very rich, and I think they can do more with that. So just very quickly, um, if you look at the, uh, the basic findings from the Choshu domain, you can see that we have sample uh, numbers, uh, and, uh, and then we have bands that give a range of uh, the 75th to 25th percentile of the interest rates in their samples for each year. And uh, so you, if you just look at those bars, you know that there's got to be a problem of sample selection because the size of them uh, changes uh, dramatically from year to year along with sample sizes. So um, it seems like one thing you would want to do from the very beginning is use some kind of multivariate analysis like some kind of hedonic regression where you would have the interest rate on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side some of those observables that we just heard about. And, uh, and then you can put other things in, uh, like these are nominal interest rates, but if there is available for this one area over time, um, rice prices and so on. And, and if, you, uh, if you do this kind of study, then you can see how the observables affect the interest rate. And since you know how the observables change from year to year in your samples, you can use them to reweight the sample and solve some of the problems of sample selection bias. It also solves another problem for them as well, or potentially. Um, one of the really interesting things about the early years is that um, they have very small samples, but that's because um, a lot of the loan contracts don't get into the samples because they don't record the interest rate. And so on the observables, you can look and see uh, how those loan contracts may differ from the ones which, uh, which are in the sample. Um, Based on other parts of the world, I can think of stories why, uh, why the interest rates that are in the contracts that specify them might be unusually high. I can also think of stories why they would be low. And so we need to think about those things. Um, and let me just turn briefly to the analysis of uh, interest rates and proto-industrialization. If um, this, they find a statistically significant uh, relationship uh, negative between the interest rate and the weight of proto-industrialization in the local economy. Um, but if you look at the uh, box that I've, uh, I've highlighted, you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity. And in particular, if you look at the low interest rates part of the graph to the left, you can see that there's a tremendous variation in the degree of proto-industrialization in the, in, the, um, in the areas that have low interest rates. And so that suggests to me that these are really being driven by something else. There are lots of things that we could think about, like um, one would be um, location, right? And those may also be things that are driving proto-industrialization. Um, and so, again, we could use some multivariate analysis to try to sort these things out and see what part, what, what, whether 
proto-industrialization and interest rates are really a function of, of something else or whether they're causally related. And finally, I'll just say that um, in this part of the analysis, there's also sample selection worries. If we just focus, um, I use different colors, but if you just focus on the ones where you have some reasonable sample sizes, um, uh, you can see, uh, if you look at the standard, I don't know if you can see this, but if you look at the standard deviations on the right, I, I honestly think that the, uh, that the statistical relationship would, would disappear. Uh, the statistical, statistical significance would disappear. And there's a lot of weird things going on in these samples. There's some where there's no variation, right, in, and in the period, and there's some where there's a lot of variation. So clearly there are different draws here, and, and the authors need to think about how those draws are affecting the results. So I think this is really important work. The two findings are really believable, but, um, but some more uh, multivariate analysis, some more attention to sample selection issues would really improve the results. So thank you. Okay, uh, we're out of time, uh, over time actually, and so I'd like to just make a con concluding comment or two. Uh, first of all, this session, as well as uh, some interviews with uh, economic historians, will be appearing on ChineseEconomicHistory.com, uh, so you can, you can see them. And I would like to add one thing, uh, since we're here in Tokyo, uh, earlier today, uh, 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 excuse me, Kyoto, <laughs> thinking my body is in one place, I'm thinking another. Uh, earlier today I was uh, interviewing Professor uh, Yoshina Bishiba, uh, and we were talking about uh, Song Chinese uh, um, economic development. Uh, and one thing that happened is at the Kyoto School, that I got right, the Kyoto School was the uh, early school in the 20th century which challenged the old version of China's uh, stagnation and so on and so forth, that it was unchanging. And the Marxists, in, and that happened here in Japan, and the Marxists uh, disagreed with that. Uh, there was a fight in the 60s and 70s, and an upshot of that is today, with the exception of uh, the Marxists largely, who refused to uh, acknowledge the relationship between uh, markets and social change. Uh, this group is small and increasingly smaller. Uh, in Japan, uh, most people view Song China as, if ha as having experienced economic growth, according to uh, Professor uh, Shiba. And that is a bit heretic uh, heretical in the United States to suggest that England was not the first country to experience economic growth. Yet, on the other side of the world, it's, uh, uh, most Song experts will say that there was economic growth, meaning growth in incomes and, and, and population, uh, here in Japan. And against, uh, uh, again, that doesn't include the uh, conservative Marxists. So for those of you in the West who do economic history or long-run economic growth, I would encourage you to take a, a, an open, line, open mind and take a look. Be critical, hold the critical standards, but uh, <coughs> there's a large group of people on this side of the world who, who view Song China as having experienced economic growth. There are also some, uh, uh, a, a good number who say the same thing about Tokugawa Japan. Uh, Eric Jones has written a book about this uh, called Growth Recurring uh, uh, quite a while ago, and it kind of fell on flat ears on the West, but it's quite uh, well accepted, or at least not controversial on this side of the world. Uh, so anyway, uh, that, that's a, a plug for people interested in long-run economic growth to uh, maybe get in a fight and debate on the other side of the world about uh, growth. Uh, I know uh, Jean de Vries has, has tried that in, with the Netherlands, uh, but it's quite uh, quite strongly established here. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, um, 
again, you can see this session as well as uh, several interviews uh, on uh, ChineseEconomicHistory.com. Thank you very much for, for your attendance. Thank you.